All right, folks, different video for you today. In the six years that I've run this channel, one piece of tech has had more of an impact on growing this business than any other, our network attached storage. It completely changed the way we make our videos, making us far more efficient. It also allowed us to expand the team with members from Norway, the United Kingdom and India, all collaborating seamlessly together. If you've ever been interested in buying a NAS or improving the effectiveness of your team, then today's video is for you. Plus, speaking personally, I don't know what it is, but there is something oddly exciting about setting up a fast network and building out a NAS. Now, I want to make something very clear up front. This is one of our rare sponsored videos, but it isn't a normal one. We've been using Synology NASs for years. I bought them with my own money. This one, for example. Since I did have such a positive experience with them, I reached out to Synology to sponsor this video in exchange for a NAS for our new office. Well, let's turn back the clock by a year and a half. That's when this business really launched. At that time, I resigned from my day job and went full time on this YouTube channel. I started hiring team members. Initially, we used to keep every video we worked on on our laptops themselves. That required a ludicrous amount of storage, 300 gigabytes per video, but we often work on several at the same time. It takes a really long time to download our videos from Dropbox onto our laptop, even on our super fast internet. By the way, Dropbox acts like our overall storage and is a short term backup for us, plus it allows our remote staff to collaborate together. Anyway, this still underestimates our issue. We have an extensive library of B-roll, which we search through to find footage to include in our videos. We also store that on Dropbox. Since none of our laptops can fit all our B-roll on their internal drives, guess what? There is a lag while you wait for footage to download that you're considering including. What compounds all this is that we switch editing laptops all the time. We use the laptops we are reviewing so that we can tell you what they're actually like. This means that we have to download all the files that we are working on onto each and every new laptop that we are switching to. Anyway, I knew that this needed to change. Luckily, I had already purchased a NAS, primarily as a backup device. But between you and me, I think I just purchased it because it was a cool piece of tech that I just wanted to play around with. Anyway, I stupidly never tried editing off it. I assumed it would be too slow. Boy, was I wrong. At the time, I had heard that Synology was the easiest to use, so that was the brand I went with. I'm very happy that I did, and I am going to talk more about that later in this video. For the drives, I went with SSDs, not hard drives. At the time I purchased the NAS, I was actually filming in my small New York City apartment. The NAS was in the same room, so I needed it to be silent. SSDs are silent, hard drives are not. Setting up the NAS was insanely straightforward. Synology NASs, they don't require tools to install drives, and their software, it guides you through the process. There are also easy to understand tutorials online and large communities of users. Funnily enough, everything we needed to start editing off the NAS, it was already in place. I'd already connected the NAS to Dropbox using their CloudSync app, and I'd already run Ethernet cables through my house, which was where we launched the business from. The moment that we plugged the laptops into the NAS, we were floored at how smoothly we were able to edit our videos. Being able to just plug in any laptop and edit straight away was a game changer. Not only this, but it improved our collaboration with our overseas team members. For example, our video editor in the UK syncs to our Dropbox. He edits overnight. By the time we start here in Arizona, our files, they were already up to date on the NAS and we can just continue editing. Prior to this, we would open up a laptop and we'd wait for it to sync to the latest version before editing. All right, now we're going to switch gears and I'm going to delve into the details of what we learned over the last 1.5 years, including when we expanded our setup by adding two more NASs in different locations. First, should you get SSDs, hard drives or a combination for video editing? Hard drives are cheaper, you get more storage, but they are louder and slower. SSDs are faster and quieter, but they have less capacity and cost a lot more. Not only this, many SSDs are not designed for NAS use. They may wear out over time. Also, I didn't mention this, but where the speed difference is quite impactful is in random access. Hard drives are quite slow here, SSDs are much faster. Anyway, to help alleviate this, Synology gives you an option to have the best of both worlds, filling your NAS with hard drives and then adding SSDs for cache. Our original 6 bay NAS has SSDs, as I mentioned, it needed to be quiet. I went with Samsung's 870 Quovo drives because I didn't know any better at the time. They were the only ones I could get with 8TB. If I had to set up a dead silent NAS today, I probably would have chosen the 4TB Western Digital Red drives. Those are designed for NAS use and I just have to deal with less storage. 
In our new office though, noise is really no longer an issue. So we went with a hybrid solution, an 8-bay NAS filled with hard drives and two SSDs for caching. Given that our SSD drives are 800 gigabytes, it's enough that most of our video projects that we are currently working on will be stored there. Even when we factor in mirroring, obviously we have two 800 gigabytes drives, but they're mirroring each other for redundancy, so we only have 800 gigabytes of storage. Now, in the real world, we notice no performance difference when editing off either of these two NASs, and pleasantly, the hard drive NAS was actually quieter than I would have thought. Still not dead silent, but totally fine in our break room. Now, don't tune out yet. I'm going to show you some proper performance results in a moment that may change your opinion. But first, we need to talk about networking, as that is obviously a core part of a NASA's performance. The first choice is what network speed you want to hit. The main ones right now are 1 gigabit, 2.5, and 10. The speeds that you need to effectively edit off a NAS, it really depends on what your footage is and what you are editing. Are you overlapping multiple 8K shots together, or are you just chopping up a single 4K file? For us, we record at H.264, 4K, 30fps at 8-bit. This requires a bandwidth of 100 megabits. Oftentimes though, we do splice and layer multiple clips together, which increases this. We have thoroughly tested all different Ethernet speeds, and here is what we found. When editing from the timeline, 1 gigabit is actually totally fine. We notice no difference stepping up to 2.5 or 10. At extremely complex parts of our videos, our laptops definitely do struggle. But since this isn't alleviated by upping our network speed, we believe the bottleneck is somewhere else, most likely the laptop itself. That being said, when rendering, we do notice a big difference. Rendering requires a huge amount of data to be read and later written very fast. Moving up from 1 to 2.5 to 10 gigabits, it definitely matters and makes a very noticeable difference. That is unless there are other bottlenecks, which is what appears to be happening with our ZenBook Pro 16X. Its render times didn't even improve when rendering on its internal drive, rather than the 1 gigabit Ethernet network. One little trick we found is that it's much quicker if you write the rendered file locally to your laptop and then copy it back to the NAS after rendering. Another suggestion is that many switches have a mix of Ethernet ports, some 10 gigabit and some slower 1 and 2.5 gigabit ones. We plug our editors who render videos into the faster ports and those who don't into the slower ones. This leads nicely into networking equipment. Unfortunately, right now 10 gigabit networking is pretty rough, particularly if you're using a laptop. Laptops at best come with 2.5 gig ports, and that's the larger gaming ones. If you want 10 gigabits, you'll need to use an adapter. They are really big and they are expensive, and they can overheat during sustained large transfers. This causes slowdowns which, on occasion, we have certainly witnessed. Secondly, consumer 10 gigabit switches are really garbage. Believe me, I've brought pretty much all of them. If you want good sustained performance, you'll need to get one with a fan. The fans that they use, they tend to be cheap, which means they are loud and often make an annoying high-pitched sound. This is just not something that you'll want to have in a home office. If you get one without a fan, just like the 10 gig adapters, they can overheat when transferring large amounts of data. Heck, I place my home one on a laptop cooling pad to at least give it some airflow. And of course, to do 10 gigabit, you need to have the right cables. There are three main cables. Cat5e, which is the oldest and is technically only rated for 1 gigabit networking. Cat6, which is rated for 10 gigabit to around 100 feet. Cat6a for 10 gigabit to around 300 feet. As I'm a tech nut, I did run Cat6A and duplex multi-mode fibre cables throughout the walls of my house. I wanted to ensure that I was definitely future-proofed. Cat6A, it can be a pain. It is a much thicker cable that just doesn't bend as easily. And finding someone who knows how to crimp it, it can be a challenge. Any electrician can work with Cat6, but you may need a specialist to work with Cat6A. And that can be expensive. Our new office, on the other hand, only has Cat5e through its walls. With this all said, let's now revisit performance and take a look at what kind of difference all these different cables, networking equipment, and different NASs and the different setups they make. To fully test everything, I did bring my home NAS into the office. By the way, I haven't mentioned this, but the reason I do keep a NAS at home is because I edit the videos there often late into the night, and it is a lot more comfortable to do that there than here. When it comes to performance, I'm going to show you some numbers up on screen. These were taken from Blackmagic Speed Test. That app shows you what size and type of footage can be edited off the drive it's testing. Keep in mind, if you are layering multiple pieces of footage together, as I said, you'll need to multiply these numbers accordingly. Also, it only shows you sequential writes and read speeds. Random writes and read speeds do matter too, as I said, but it's a good basic test. 
When we stack rank our results by write speeds, here is what we found. The slowest result was when we limited ourselves to 1 gigabit networking. That was followed by 2.5. Once you move up to 10 gigabit, under every scenario speeds were a lot faster, even when testing over Cat5e cables from the break room to my office which is around 50 feet. This all being said, we did notice very large gaps in write speeds depending on the setup. Read speeds were pretty much always the same, always getting close to the 10 gigabit cap. By the way, we're still researching why read speeds were so much better than write. If you know the answer, please post a comment down below. Anyway, what we found was to reliably get the faster speeds, the SSD NAS combined with very short Cat5e cable runs or using Cat6 is what is needed. The hybrid HDD and SSD NAS did well, but it was a step back. It never got within 200 megabits of write speeds of the pure SSD NAS. This kind of makes sense. The hybrid NAS uses an NVMe cache drive with 1000 megabytes of write speeds and 3000 megabytes of read speeds. And although it has two of them, as they mirror each other, their speeds don't change. The SSD NAS has six drives, of which one is used for parity. It can write at around 2500 megabytes per second, so a good amount more. FYI, a bit of computer science, there are 8 bits to a byte, so to max out the write speeds of our 1 gigabyte per second cache drive, the one that is in this hybrid NAS, we'd need more than 8 gigabits of bandwidth. I said more than because data is transmitted with packet headers, which is a little extra data. To max out our SSD NAS, we'd need at least 20 gigabits of bandwidth. Anyway, you can see that the SSD NAS can more fully utilise our 10 gigabit connection. The only time the SSD NAS did poorly was when it was tested from my office, which as I said is a longer Cat5e run. Now you may notice that some Cat5e runs do well from my office, so I used iPer3 to measure networking performance from my office to the NASs. What we found was that Cat5e can indeed hit close to the max networking speeds of 10 gigabits, but not always. It's just not as reliable as a closer Cat5e run or using Cat6. Both of these almost always hit the max 10 gigabit transfer speeds. Finally, let's talk Synology. There are a couple of things that I do want to call out that I think are either misunderstood or unknown. Firstly, if you view Synology as a hardware NAS company in isolation, they may not appear as competitive as other brands. You can likely build a custom NAS cheaper and run free NAS. Plus, some people may be annoyed that some of their NASs do warn you if you don't use their own drives, and those are pricey. This is not what Synology's value prop is. If you buy everything from Synology, you only have one place to call regardless of whether your issue is with the NAS, the drives or the software. From a business owner's perspective, that does have huge value. Secondly, Synology has lagged in one key aspect of their NASA's hardware. Many of their NASA's, their cheaper ones, they only use 1 gigabit Ethernet speeds. Good news, new NASA's are coming out this year with 2.5. And by the way, Synology does support SMB3, which allows you to pull multiple Ethernet connections together for more bandwidth. So you could connect two or more Ethernet ports from your NAS to your switch for faster transfer speeds. That's assuming that your switch to your computer can support those higher speeds. Think about it like a highway where each lane is limited to a certain speed, but you can transfer more goods by using more lanes. Lastly, and this is a big one, with Synology we don't need to use Dropbox and that saves us huge dollars. Dropbox currently charges us over $1,100 per year for four licenses. That's expensive. With Synology's drive share, we can sync between our NASs directly. There is no additional charge for this. If you have users that don't have a NAS, don't worry, Synology does have the option for them to still access the files remotely, just like Dropbox's client would. We just switched our editor in the UK to use a third Synology NAS and we're currently moving to this solution. So let's wrap. My overall recommendation is the following. If you're looking to set up a fast network for home or office and you are running fresh cables, run Cat6 not Cat6a. There is likely no need for the added headache of Cat6a unless your space is obviously huge or you're an enthusiast. In that case though, consider running Fibre. For home users, be satisfied with 2.5 gigabit networking gear. You can upgrade your equipment later on. I'd only go 10 gigabit now if you can place switches in closets, so you can get ones with fans. Oh, and if you're using desktop computers, not laptops, carrying adapters everywhere with you, as I said, it is annoying. If your space is already wired with Cat5e and you want 10 gigabit, it does work, even though it may not always give you 10 gigabit speeds. From a cost perspective, it's probably not worth ripping out and replacing the cables unless it's really causing you major issues. 
And when it comes to Synology, please consider that with them, you are likely spending more upfront for less ongoing costs like Dropbox as I mentioned, and less headaches in the future having to work with multiple different companies if you have issues. Well, that's all I got for you. If you want me to push the envelope and try 25 gigabit or higher networking speeds over fiber, then leave a comment down below. If we get to a thousand comments, I'll do it. And guys, I really do want to do it. Till next time, go do something awesome with your day and I will catch you later.